This is going to be a fun show. Mark has been back there practicing his skits all day. I walked past the dressing room. Mark was staring into the mirror like Natalie Portman and Black Swan for an hour. Please welcome Mark Ellis. Angeles, how's everybody doing? Oh, it is so good to be here. We have a lot to get through. I have to start with this. I know a lot of you came out here for a great stand-up show, but some of you came here just to make sure I was, in fact, still alive. Um, <laughs> and this is sort of my fault, and I need to apologize for it, because I was excited about the show as we're taping it. It's Saturday night. This past Wednesday, I got a flyer, and I was like, oh, I know. I'll post this flyer on social media so people know about the show. I posted the picture, and it's a good picture of me, I thought. <laughs> it's me on stage, microphone, smiling, whimsical look in my eye. You can tell this boy's dream is coming true. <laughs> but the problem was, it was a black and white photo. <laughs> so already, some fans of mine started to get nervous. <laughs> They're like, oh no, what happened to the boy with the dream? <laughs> it's a black and white photo, nobody ever does that. And then the mistake was compounded because there was like a bluish hue over my head. <laughs> I looked like a force ghost in retrospect. And then it said Mark Ellis live special taping, but it wasn't the letters like live special taping. It was way at the bottom, live special taping. <laughs> and the kind of font it was can only be described as church pamphlet cursive. So I posted it, thinking, all right, let's see how it goes. An hour later, I check Instagram, over a 1,000 likes. And I'm like, somebody's selling out some shows this weekend. <laughs> and then I saw the comments. Top comment, over 100 likes on it. What the fuck, dude, are you dead? <laughs> all lowercase, no punctuation. And it's very out of character for my mom to use that kind of language. <laughs> So I'm here tonight to entertain you, but also to let everybody know that I am alive, I am well, I am in my adopted home of Southern California. We have a packed house here, and I'm so glad y'all showed up. I really am, because I need a theater full of people to get out of the house. It's a rough pandemic for me, man, because I'm an optimist. And I think a lot of optimists had a really tough time the last couple years. If you're in this room and you see the glass is half full, if you see the COVID test is half negative. <laughs> Pandemic started, all of us optimists were like, we got this. Humanity can do this. Let's get this over with. We walked in there. We're like, we can all wear masks for two weeks, okay? We'll mask up 14 days. Day 15, we'll all go outside, rip our masks off in unison breathe the fresh air, throw it in the air like it's a high school graduation ceremony. <laughs> Except we didn't graduate, did we? No. America, we were the kid that got held back. <laughs> and it was a tough one for me personally because when the pandemic started, I was in my 30s. <laughs> I marched into that thing, a confident, healthy, energetic 30-something. Cut to me coming out, a tired, grizzled, broken, 40-something. What's a TikTok? <laughs> Who names a stallion Meg? Where are my Wednesday pills? <laughs> I was like a wolf that had been hunting in the wild, then it got domesticated for a couple years, and now I'm on the tundra, and I can't hunt anymore. I'm just out there running with the pack. Guys, Postmates isn't going to be here for another eight hours, so... <laughs> We all went a little minimalist, right? We all got a little isolated the last couple years. Everybody got a new hobby. Everybody got a new hobby. We got some bread people here. <laughs> got some, you know who got crazy is the air fryer folk. <laughs> yeah. Some of you fuckers with air fryers. Y'all started out conservative, right? You got the air fryer. The first week you plug it in. All right, don't make any sudden movements. And what was your first meal with the air fryer? Let's just do one bagel bite. Get down, get down. And then week two, everybody thought they were Guy Fieri. 
<laughs> we got a whole cow. We're going to see if we can fit it into this one air fryer. I got a new hobby, too. I started doing drugs. Thank you. You saw my last special dog, Stepfather. You know, I don't do the drugs, and, uh, well, that's in the past. <laughs> and I don't know what they were talking about in high school. Not only am I having fun, I think I'm hooked. It's a good time. I like the edibles. I like the weed. It helps me sleep, helps me relax, takes the edge off the blow. And part of the fun for me, too, is that I'm old enough to remember when it was illegal. So now, when I go to a dispensary, I still feel like I'm doing something a little naughty. <laughs> you know, I walk, I tiptoe in. <laughs> hey, man, you think the cops are here? There's a security guard at every dispensary. <laughs> I go to this place in the valley called Ice Cream. But the cream is spelled with a K, so you know that ain't ice cream in my bag. <laughs> and I acknowledge I started way too late. I'm way too late in the game. Like drugs, it's like skiing or golf. If you want to get good, you got to start when you're a little kid, right? Because <laughs> nobody has good drug stories my age. That happens when you're young, right? Like, uh, how old were you? Your, your first drug? 16? Okay. It, was it the weed, or did you just slam the H right in your toes? What was the... <laughs> <laughs> you can tell I'm new, because I still call it the weed. Like. <laughs> I go to you know, ice cream. Do you sell doobies here? Is that a thing? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I, like, I'm jealous of that. Because like you're 16, you get high, you probably had fun. Man, we got cut class, and then we woke up in a dumpster. Like, it's a funny story. <laughs> What's a good drugstore in your 40s? Man, I got so high last night, I lost my family. Yeah, me and the boys, we got baked over the weekend, and now we live in Extended Stay America. So I don't know how. And I'll still make rookie mistakes with it, too. I, uh, I like to, usually my routine is I'll do my shows at night, and then I'll do an edible when I get home, watch my stories, and go to bed. <laughs> right? A couple weeks ago, I didn't have any shows. It was a Tuesday night. It was like 6.30, and I'm like, I think it's enough. I think I've waited long enough to get the edible in here. So I crank it into my gullet, and I start feeling it. Then I realize, oh, no, Mark didn't eat dinner yet. <laughs> That's mistake number one. Then I uh, made another one by deciding it was a good time to go to the grocery store. <laughs> See? All you professionals are like, dude, you cannot be doing this to me right now. <laughs> it gets worse. So when I'm sober, I shop at Whole Foods. Where are my Whole Foods people at? There you go. Clap if you think you're better than everybody. That's, <laughs> that's been me for the better part of the last decade as I go to Whole Foods. But on this particular night, I got high, and I was like, I think it's time to go back to Ralph's. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Ralph's, for my East Coast friends, it's like the Food Lion or the Wegmans. <laughs> Up in the Pacific Northwest, it's like the QFC. It's the normal grocery store, but I've been going to Whole Foods forever. So then I got high, and I went back to Ralph's, and it was like I was skipping into Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. <laughs> oh, it was beautiful. Everything that I remember was there. The snacks, the desserts, deodorant that actually works. It's an amazing place. As Soon as I walked into this land of miracles, I grabbed a balloon. It wasn't my birthday, I just wanted the balloon. And then I hit aisle six. And aisle six, for you Rouse regulars, you know, that's the cereal aisle. Yeah. And to me that night, that was the Asgardian bridge to Valhalla. <laughs> I remember all the cereals. Tony the Tiger waving me back. We missed you, bud. Because <laughs> Whole Foods, they don't have a cereal aisle. If you're lucky, they have a lady handing granola on the way out. <laughs> they have one sad shelf with a couple different cereals. The best stuff at Whole Foods is this stuff called Heritage Crunch. Sounds like it's from the Revolutionary War. <laughs> Heritage Crunch? Heritage is another word for old. <laughs> I'm not starting a new day with old crunch. <laughs> I don't want to eat Heritage Crunch. I'd like to speak to the captain of crunch, if I may. <laughs> Heritage Crunch sounds like Captain Crunch's racist grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> After you boys are done playing pirates, I got this flag I want to show you in my study. Come here. <laughs> and 
And all of us uh, marijuana users got some good news recently. President Biden, he, uh, he repealed it. Anybody who ever had a simple possession, that's gone. You're pardoned. You're good to go, which is good news. It's good news. Um, I don't necessarily want Biden himself doing uh, the drugs. Um, <laughs> I love that every time there's an election cycle, every time we're looking at who the new president could be, the media always loves asking that question. Have you ever gotten high? You ever smoked weed? Like, I remember the first time I saw it was when I was a kid and they asked Clinton. Yeah. And Clinton was like, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you come on back to my room, find out. <laughs> and then they asked George W. Bush the question and he did not understand it. And <laughs> Obama was the first one. Obama was the first one who just flat out admitted, and he shocked everybody. So, he, have you ever smoked pot? And he was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> really fun. <laughs> so Obama admitted he smoked weed. Trump claimed he never did. And I don't know if y'all noticed, slight difference in temperament. <laughs> now, I'm not saying Trump doesn't do drugs, but if he does, weed is not the one he's been enjoying. <laughs> And you could tell as the presidency started to unravel, right? There's supposed to be like a peaceful transition of power. There's supposed to be a nice sit down between the sitting president and the incoming president. And it works like a relay race, right? Like the president has the baton, they hand it to the next one. So here comes Donnie around the corner and he's about to hand the baton to Joe and he's like, fuck you, go get it. <laughs> One of the last things Trump did when he was in office is he took Air Force One out. You know where they were going? Nowhere. <laughs> they didn't have a destination. He just wanted to be in the big plane one more time. <laughs> so my theory is they got in the plane, they did a few laps around DC, they did a mountain of Coke, <laughs> probably came up with a great idea for a fusion restaurant. <laughs> and then the plane lands. And the last thing Trump did before he deplaned Air Force One for the very last time I think Trump took an upper decker in the bathroom. <laughs> now, some of you in this crowd may be too classy to know what an upper decker is. Luckily for you, I went to college in North Carolina. <laughs> so an upper decker is where you poop, not in the toilet, but you take the lid off the back, you poop in there, put the toilet lid back on, nobody knows where the smell is coming from. <laughs> and I don't think the Biden administration has found it yet. <laughs> and that's why Biden trips every time he goes up the stairs to Air Force One. <laughs> I feel so bad for that poor bastard when he trips on the stairs, but I'm also kind of impressed at the athleticism because he falls up. <laughs> I don't know which pill in the matrix he took, but he just keeps going. He's like a reverse slinky. It's an actually incredible thing. And weed isn't even really the cool drug for the kids, for the, the Gen Zs, the millennials. Y'all like your shrooms now. <laughs> Got shroom people. They have their fun little terms like microdosing. Like, oh no, I'm microdosing. Like it's not like you're doing drugs still. <laughs> microdosing, it's like, I'm not an alcoholic, it's a coronita, just a tiny little one. <laughs> shrooms, shrooms is what happens when you give disposable income to a generation raised on Mario Kart. <laughs> Been taught these shrooms were good for you your whole life. And I mean, my era's before that, like I, my Mario didn't have a vehicle. If you were lucky, you had a dinosaur give you a lift in like one level. <laughs> but I go all the way back to the original Super Mario Brothers, which was the best because it was so easy. They would just aim you in one direction, and this is your whole video game right here. <laughs> if you ran too far this way, you can't even go back that way. Get your fat ass to the castle. <laughs> the premise of Super Mario Brothers, a king's daughter gets kidnapped by a giant dragon. <laughs> and he sends two Italian plumbers to go rescue her. <laughs> The king got all his hands together and he's like, all right, we need to get my little girl back. I do not want to spend a lot of money, ideas. <laughs> and they're like, well, Navy SEALs, that's expensive. Marines are pretty costly. One guy raised his hand. Hey, you remember those two guys that fixed the toilet last week? <laughs> yeah, the one found the upper decker. We had no idea what that smell was. I'm a, big, uh, I'm a big sports fan. I love the NFL. I, uh, I played college football on Xbox and um, <laughs> had to retire concussions. You know how it goes. <laughs> but even the sports games are getting tougher to play. Like, like Madden is so complex now. Madden, you can actually make yourself 
into an NFL player. You can make me <laughs> into an NFL athlete, which is actually easier than going to the gym. Because like I could be sore tomorrow or I can win the Super Bowl right now. And, and it's weird being a sports fan my age, because I'm 42 years old, and you realize that now every ad is targeted right at you. Everyone, every time I watch a game, every time I listen to sports talk radio, every ad starts the same way. Are you past your prime? <laughs> Do you not have the energy you used to? I think it's me they're talking to. <laughs> Are you a little bitch, Mark? Who sang that? Trying to hop us up on energy, boys. Now I'm nervous. Every time I go work out, every time I go to the driving range, I'm worried Doug Flutie and Frank Thomas are going to jump out of the bushes, throw some pills at me. Don't take the bait, man. I'm too old to have energy. Energy's going to get me arrested. Go out after the show. You're going to see a bunch of guys in their 20s, and they have way too much energy. They're like, oh, it's Saturday. i got to fuck something or fight something. I don't know what it's going to be. And I was like that. When I was in my 20s, I wanted to date every woman I saw, right? Same thing in my 30s. In my 40s, I want to sleep. <laughs> that's it. And energy, that's going to fuck up my nap. <laughs> I love naps, man. I took, a na I took the 5 p.m. today. <laughs> I refer to naps like it's a train schedule. <laughs> I took the 5 p.m. backstage, and that's my favorite one, because the 5 p.m. is where you go to bed, and it's light out. And then you wake up and it's dark and you're like, what the fuck happened? Where am I? <laughs> like, I thought about this. I love sleep so much, I no longer fear death. <laughs> it's just a good snooze. <laughs> so when you're at my funeral, we'll use the picture I posted. <laughs> But don't, if you get to eulogize me, don't do the, the normal stuff. Don't say Mark died doing what he loved. No, say Mark's dead, and now he's doing what he loves. <laughs> I try to make it to the gym when I can. I, um, I have a personal trainer, because I work in entertainment, and that's the law. <laughs> Seriously, all you dreamers out there thinking about moving to LA, here's how it works. You drive out to California, they stop you at the border, you surrender all your fruits and vegetables, and they hand you a personal trainer. Sir, you got to give us those avocados, and this is Cricket, your trainer. Enjoy. <laughs> they're just so optimistic and positive all the time. Like, I go to the gym, and they're like, all right, Mark, today's leg day. And I'm like, uh, leg day, how do you think I got in here? We are good on the legs. <laughs> they demo the movements for you, which is a little intimidating, because they show you how to do it properly, and then I have to follow that. And they're like, Mark, here's how you do a deadlift. And I'm like thinking that's how a 28-year-old does a deadlift. <laughs> I'm 42. My deadlift is call two of my friends. <laughs> hey, you assholes want free pizza? Help me move this couch. Get over here. It's still going better than it was. When I first got out here, I didn't know what to do. I joined a gym called 24-Hour Fitness. And uh, it sounds like a good premise, right? It's open all day, all night. Problem was, back then, I was chubby. I was robust. I was portly. I'm trying to think of other phrases that aren't the F word. <laughs> we're not supposed to say the thing I called Mario and Luigi. I'm not supposed to say that. I feel like I can say the word fat. Most of my best friends are fat. So <laughs> that was an accurate description of me at the time when I was out here. And if you're in my situation, 24-hour fitness is tough. There's never a good hour to go. You can either go in the middle of the night when it's just you and some nutcase wearing a Spider-Man costume right next to you. <laughs> Put down the camera, Peter. I get it. <laughs> or you can go in the middle of the day, which is the worst time to go if you're overweight, because it's always the good-looking athletic, the winners in life on the treadmills, and then there's just a line of chubby people like, we would have been in at TGI Fridays by now. What's the... <laughs> I'm sorry, but I think if you're the biggest one at the gym, you can go up to anybody. Uh, yeah, excuse me. <laughs> you're training for a triathlon? That's cute. Last night, I got drunk and ate a birthday cake yeah. by myself. <laughs> you're 5% body fat? I'm 5% dominoes. Off you go. Yeah, that's the phrase, man, past your prime. And I'm not ready to admit that I'm past my prime yet. I will say this is as good as it's going to get. So <laughs> any of you ladies thinking about it, tonight's the night. 
And every time I like I'm talking to a girl who's younger than me, I feel like a desperate stockbroker. <laughs> like, like trying to talk her into a stock that I know is shit. Because guys, when you're in your 20s, in investment terms, you're like gold, you're silver, you're precious metals. You're going to last forever. Once you hit 40, you're cryptocurrency. <laughs> you know, like I look good tonight, it could all be gone tomorrow. <laughs> and you have to make do with what you have. We have pills for some stuff, we have surgeries for other things, but nothing's going to make these hands any bigger. <laughs> I don't care who you voted for. These are Trump hands. We can all admit that, right? So just tiny little grabbing any pussy power documents before you leave office. And if you look at it throughout the history of time, every dictator had tiny little hands. That's why they had to be a dictator. Every cult leader, tiny hands. Every one of them, Jonestown, Nexium, Peloton, they all have tiny little hands just begging you to stay with them on this journey. <laughs> Keep pedaling the bike, Mark. Hands are going to stay this size. Feet aren't going to grow anymore. I'll be honest, once you hit a certain age, this doesn't work as well. I'm not ashamed to admit it. My reproductive area, it's about as effective as the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. <laughs> you know, like it's probably going to be okay. Let's <laughs> I got a 66% completion percentage. Let's go in the bedroom. <laughs> that was the thing that bothered me. Is like I was all for a vaccine. I wanted a vaccine, but the way we rolled it out, this kind of thought was dumb because like people think that Americans want free. We don't. We don't want anything free. We say we do. I want free health care. Then you got free health care. I don't trust this shit anymore. <laughs> we want exclusive. OK, we don't want free. We want exclusive. Think about it. You came to the show tonight. If everybody got a free t-shirt, you'd be like, look at this cheap piece of shit. <laughs> but I could take this whole crowd to a basketball game, and the mascot comes out with the t-shirt cannon. You're losing your goddamn minds. Give me the shirt. Give me the shirt. So next time there's a pandemic, I want a vaccine. Don't get me wrong. I want there to be a vaccine, but just don't announce it because we can't handle it. It's going to get politicized. It's going to get divisive. Make the vaccine and just put it in McNuggets. <laughs> yeah. You vaccinate the McNuggets, the whole pandemic is going to be over in three weeks. <laughs> and then when it's time for our booster shot, the McRib is back for a limited time only. <laughs> I thought you retired it. Well, monkeypox brought it out of retirement, baby. <laughs> you know anti-vaxxers would find out, though. They find out we're spiking the McNuggets with medicine. <laughs> Maybe protesting outside Mickey D's. You didn't tell us what you're putting in the McNuggets. And McDonald's is like, we've never told you what we're putting in the McNuggets. <laughs> you think the clown tells us what he's doing up there? We don't know. Go to McDonald's after the show. Ask them what's in a quarter pounder. They're like, oh, there's some brown. Um, it's a little thing of orange, I think. <laughs> they always have their excuses, you know, their conspiracy theories. Some people thought they were getting microchipped when they got the vaccine. So they thought they were getting microchipped at Walgreens. That's where we're keeping them, really? That's where the government's storing the microchips? At Walgreens, right next to the self-checkout that doesn't work for more than 10 consecutive minutes. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you got microchipped at Walgreens, nobody knows where the fuck you are right now. You're safe. <laughs> they always have the same reasoning. Like, I don't want the government to know what I'm doing or where I'm going. Three hours later, we tell them, we're all Buffalo Wild Wings. Get in here. Selfie. <laughs> I was thinking about this a lot, and I, I don't think it'd be the worst thing if we microchipped humanity. <laughs> okay? I don't think it'd be the worst thing. Just go with me on this. Because currently on Earth, we have one species that we regularly microchip, and dogs look pretty happy. <laughs> I have a dog. She was better than anybody in this room. She gets to sleep all the time. She gets to eat more. She gets the whole food shit. She gets to go outside. She gets to take a shit outside. 
the smile on this young boy's face when I said that. <laughs> You're like, really, I could do that? Yeah. <laughs> Get microchips on, yes, you too. The, don't you just want to try that freedom once? Just go right out there on Wilshire Boulevard and just drop trowel and nobody gets mad at you like, oh, this is great. They don't get mad at you, they get mad at you for not picking it up. How great would that be? <laughs> oh, he's so cute. Bring a bag, asshole. I did that joke in New York and uh, this woman yelled out in the back, what about cats? I'm like, yeah, I know, we microchip cats, I guess, and cats are, I don't consider them pets. They're more like in-laws. <laughs> you know, like they, they kind of show up and they just don't really leave and there's technically love there, but it's, they're just really judging you. <laughs> you feed them once, they just stay. I don't know, I, I did have like, I, I was suspicious of the vaccine recently because, I don't know if anybody else is going through this, I can't remember shit. <laughs> like my memory's awful and it's the kind of memory loss where if you're looking for your keys, then you're like, oh, I was holding my keys the whole time. <laughs> or like, I can't find my sunglasses, they're on my head. Or how long I've been driving this car for? Ooh, this is not good. <laughs> and every time that happens to me, my knee jerk reaction is that's the vaccine. <laughs> Never once did I consider it might be due to the fact that I now do drugs every <laughs> night of my life. <laughs> that never came up in the thought process. You know, a couple edibles, some beers every night. I don't know why my brain's foggy. <laughs> it's gotta be that one shot of medicine I got eight months ago. <laughs> but I did discover a hidden benefit to marijuana. A hidden power to marijuana is that now documentaries last forever. Because <laughs> I'll put on a documentary, hi, I'll watch 20 minutes, fall asleep. The next night, I go to pick it up, and I'm like, I don't remember the last 15 minutes of what I watched last night. I think it's time to go back to one-part documentaries. They're getting a little too beefy. Not every story needs 10 parts. I watched a 13-part documentary on whether a woman fell down the stairs or not. That's the whole documentary. <laughs> she wasn't a famous athlete or an international conflict. We were just figuring out, is she clumsy or did she marry the wrong guy? I don't know. <laughs> and I was riveted. I was like, did she fall? Was she pushed? Why do I care about this person? <laughs> when I was a kid, I watched a documentary on the formation of the universe. <laughs> One hour. <laughs> With commercials. Now there is some subject matter that dictates you need a longer time to tell the story. My favorite documentary of all time, Ken Burns' The Civil War. <laughs> or as we'll call it in 10 years, Civil War One. <laughs> I hope we can all laugh about that in a decade, but I don't know. I'm fascinated by the Civil War. I grew up on a lot of those battlefields and it goes through everything. The Civil War documentary is comprehensive. You get the Battle of Fort Sumter, the surrender at Appomattox, Captain America and Iron Man duking it out. <laughs> but the most fascinating part of it to me is the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. So as the story goes, Abraham and Mary Todd, they saw a play that night at Ford's Theater after a long day of vampire hunting. <laughs> Can anybody name what play they were at? Oh, <laughs> I have the best goddamn fans in the world. <laughs> They're like, all right, we can't just yell it out. We'll raise our hand and hope he calls on us. All right, you, guy that really wants to take a shit outside. What do you, uh, what's, our American cousin? Uh, we were looking for Jersey Boys. He was actually saying Jersey Boys. No, you're right, it was, it was our American cousin and uh, you can still go see Ford's Theater. I grew up in DC, you can still go to Ford's Theater, see the balcony, you can see next door where John Wilkes Booth snuck in, it's a hard rock cafe. <laughs> right, so John Wilkes Booth had a big bowl of Heritage Crunch and then he starts <laughs> needling into the hard rock cafe. It's a genius plot because nobody's gonna hear a gunshot when we're rocking out to Def Leppard. So Booth jumps in, he caps Lincoln, and he was a known actor at the time. <laughs> you thought fuckers could get canceled today. <laughs> he shot the president, and then being the, you know, the thespian he is, he made a show. He jumped on stage, broke his leg in the process, but landed, and he said to the crowd, Six Semper Tyrannus. 
<laughs> which is Latin for thus to all tyrants, but I have a feeling not a lot of people in here knew that. <laughs> and it's nothing against y'all. I didn't know it either. But man, crowds were educated in the 1860s. <laughs> This guy just shot the president of the United States. He jumps on stage, says shit in Latin, and they're all like, wow, okay, I get it. I, I see what he's doing. <laughs> the other actors are on stage like, do I yes and this? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, put that in context today. If somebody broke in here and they shot me in the back of the head and said six separate Tyrannus, the cops would be interviewing y'all after the show. <laughs> <laughs> Did he say anything? I think he said something about Antifa. I, I, I really don't. <laughs> You're a good crowd. We can talk about abortion. Um, I don't want to do it either, but I'm a white man. It's my job to tell you ladies how to feel about your bodies. I don't have a uterus. Here's what to do with yours. Those who can't do, teach. You know what? I'll back up. So, <laughs> a little while ago, my Twitter account got hacked. Um, my Twitter account got hacked. And everybody in this crowd knows Twitter. If you're watching this a few months later, Twitter was an app on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> Where you could get some information and you could realize that the thing you've loved your whole life is actually stupid. And so my Twitter account got hacked, and I verified had the blue check mark before the bird had a yard sale. I had the verified. <laughs> and so it's my blue check mark, it's my name, it's my picture, but I couldn't get in there. It was a scam, and the scam posted from my account, which people trust. Hey guys, I know times are tough right now, but I'm selling PlayStation 5s for 50 bucks. <laughs> and I'm donating all the proceeds to charity. And this happened to be the day when Roe v. Wade was being overturned. And so on my timeline, a lot of women I follow, a lot of women I admire, were saying very important things. One of the prevalent themes of that day was, where are all the men right now? <laughs> we need men to speak up. Men are being awfully silent. Here comes Mark, who wants a PlayStation 5 for 50 bucks? <laughs> The skirts are dealing with something. Come on, boys, let's play video games. <laughs> and for the record, I am pro-choice. I think that's a pretty easy <laughs> way to go about it. You're a woman, you're pregnant, it's your decision. I will also say that if I'm the one that got you pregnant, I know which team I'm rooting for. But it's not my call. That's the problem. Men always want to get involved. We, we look at everything in terms of competition, in terms of athletics. So we want to be on the playing surface. But in this particular ball game, we're not on the playing surface. We're in the rafters just cheering for our side. You know? <laughs> Good luck, honey. We don't want it. <laughs> and I just hate, anytime you have a debate about modern science, some asshole has to say, well, let's see what the Bible has to say about this. And it's like, oh, God, here we go. Like, and, like, I have nothing, I have a lot against the Bible. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I, look, I think the Bible's fine. I think it's a great prequel to Lord of the Rings. Here's the problem. I just hate when religion messes with science because it's never the other way around, right? Science never messes with religion. Nobody's ever been caught sneaking a microscope into church. Never hear a priest make a baptism like I now baptize you in two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. <laughs> no, it's always the other way around. And I hate when religion messes with chicken restaurants. <laughs> Y'all know exactly the one I'm talking about. <laughs> because it's Saturday night and you got about an hour to get there. Chick-fil-A closes on Sundays, which makes no sense as a business because it's not going to make any of us more religious. <laughs> I know I'm not the only idiot that has rolled up to a Chick-fil-A on a Sunday hungover. <laughs> like, oh, right, God damn it. <laughs> Nobody's going to Chick-fil-A on a Sunday, see that they're closed, and be like, oh, well, I guess we'll go worship. <laughs> I don't need waffle fries. I just need one wafer and some grape juice. That'll tide me over. <laughs> And Chick-fil-A is just closed on Sunday. That place looks like it hasn't been open in a hundred years. 
it's a horror movie. There's like tumbleweeds in the parking lot, windows shot out, old guy in a rocking chair. We don't get many visitors no more. <laughs> and I'm not saying the Bible can't teach us some stuff about modern life. For instance, the very first Karen is in the Bible. Yeah. Very first book, book of Genesis. You got Adam and you got Eve. And God said, okay, Adam, Eve, here's the deal. You can do whatever you want in paradise. There's just this one tree I don't want you to touch. Cool? And Adam's like, got it. And Eve was like, I'd like to speak to a manager. <laughs> I just feel like if you're going to make a law that governs women's bodies based on belief, it needs to be the belief that every woman subscribes to. So make abortion legal only when Mercury's in retrograde. <laughs> I might have had one of my female friends write that joke. I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't believe in that shit, but I did wait until it was out of retrograde to tape my special, so. <laughs> now, the real problem I have is, uh, is the guys in the room. Any guys who are anti-abortion, I don't understand that. If you're a dude in this room and you're anti-abortion, you need to go to Disneyland. Because you'll be in there for, what, five seconds? You're like, Jesus, they're everywhere. <laughs> I feel so bad for the families at Disneyland. Like, there's two kinds of people that go to Disneyland. You have the families, and then out here in California, we grow these weird Disney adults. <laughs> and, you know, God bless them. I don't know where the money comes from, but <laughs> it's going to mouse ears and turkey legs, and they're having a damn good time. And they're just walking around enjoying Disneyland. Then you have the families, and it's always the moms doing the hard work, right? It's always the moms. They've been training for this all season long. They have like nine fanny packs. This is a military operation. <laughs> they're barking out orders to their kids. Fast pass, churro, dole whip, go, go. <laughs> Where's dad? Dad's always trailing by 20 yards, pushing a stroller with nothing in it. <sighs> There's no beer anywhere, really? And it's this weird thing because every day at sundown, the families are trying to get out of Disneyland, and that's when the Disney adults start coming in. And so you have this battle of the bastards between the two. It's just an army of strollers versus a battalion of trust funds coming at them. And again, it's just like watching the families walk out of Disneyland. Here's what I propose. I think as you exit Disneyland, you should be able to take a left and go to parking, or take a right and get a vasectomy right then and there. <laughs> Honey, you get the car. I got one more ride I got to go on real quick. <laughs> and make it part of the fun. You know, let Goofy perform it. <laughs> Put a sign up, Mr. Toad's urology, and you get in the office, you're waiting, the seven dwarfs march in. Doc gives you the anesthesia. Here comes Goofy in a smock. A hook, you're done. <laughs> Mickey's waving to you. Now we both talk like this. <laughs> And it's Disneyland, so on your way out of the office, you get a picture of yourself getting a vasectomy. <laughs> Disney's one of those weird corporations, though, that liberals and conservatives kind of hate at the same time, <laughs> over the same subject, just for different reasons. Like, last year, we got that Buzz Lightyear movie, and both sides hated it. Conservatives thought that Buzz Lightyear made every kid in America gay. <laughs> Not sure what they based it on, but that's what the belief was. <laughs> And liberals were like, where was Buzz Lightyear on January 6th? <laughs> but you can't hate Disney. You can't. They own everything we've ever loved. <laughs> like, for instance, for me, big Star Wars fan. We got Star Wars fans here. There we go. I love Star Wars. Favorite Star Wars character, sir? Who you got? Jar Jar Binks. Jar it's it, it, Jar Jar Binks? <laughs> really? Hey, look, I am not going to hate on Jar Jar, but if that's your first round pick, how's your fantasy team doing this year, sir? If that's. <laughs> you drafted the kicker in the first round? I'll give you a deal. Okay, so it's not Jar Jar. Who is it? Luke Skywalker. There you go. That's a, that's a born and bred hero. He's in my top five. I like Leia. I like Chewie, who is microchipped. Um, but my favorite Star Wars character of all time, Yoda. Love me some Yoda. Not the baby. We all remember the last joke. Not the baby. 
<laughs> I like OG Yoda. I like Yoda. And it's not because Yoda's wise. It's not because Yoda's powerful. I love Yoda because Yoda's 900 years old. 900. Yoda's a 900-year-old man. Not one sexual assault allegation against him. <laughs> Not one. He's been on the Jedi Council for 700 years. Never a secretary. <laughs> never a Christmas party. Never a road gig in Jacksonville. Legal, she looked. Never <laughs> happened once. You ladies imagine getting a damn from Yoda in the middle of the night? <laughs> Just says, up you? Yoda's on the straight and narrow, man. He never got tag hash to mead. <laughs> of all the jokes you're gonna see tonight, that was the hardest fucking one to pull off. <laughs> that little Muppet. <laughs> that syntax is something special, man. And I am not a Jedi. I do know this about Star Wars. Uh, the fans are spoiled. <laughs> Like, you fans that are so spoiled. Because you have 12 movies, you have a new episode of a TV show every week, and you still find flaws. You're like, oh, I don't know, that speeder is bright pink. Really? Is that what we're doing? <laughs> Why don't you take the DeLorean back to my, my era, when I was a kid, in the 90s, when we had to read new Star Wars. Yeah. And we actually had to read it. Not like you Game of Thrones fans who claim to read the books. Game of Thrones fans, they love telling their friends they read the books. They buy the books, they put them on a nice shelf, and then they listen to the books in audio form. You didn't read the books, you had them read to you, like an infant. My niece and my nephews, they're super into Harry Potter. They love Harry Potter. So much so that this past uh, Halloween, when the Ellis family went trick-or-treating together, we all had to go as Harry Potter characters. And guess who got to be the person of honor? Yeah. My niece, she asked me the day before Halloween, she's like, Uncle Mark, uh, we talked about it. <laughs> and in my head, I'm like, shit, is this an intervention? Is it? <laughs> and she's like, we want you to be Harry. Aww. And yeah, it was so cute. And I knew I was gonna break her heart because I said yes, and I'll, and I'll do everything I can to pull off Harry Potter, but she's seven. She's expecting the kid from the movies. She's not expecting middle-aged, burned out, Hasn't cast a spell in 30 years, Harry Potter. <laughs> Still wearing his Gryffindor robe, but gets a high school varsity jacket. <laughs> but Harry Potter, I'll give it credit, man. Adults love that too, and I think it kind of still works. Like there's some things that we all loved as kids that just don't work when you're a grown up. He-Man, great example. You would not find a better fan of He-Man than I. I was the biggest He-Man fan when I was five years old. Other things I enjoyed when I was five, included eating my own boogers and having my mom wipe my ass because I don't know how to do it yet. <laughs> but my, my buddy called me, he's 45 years old. He called me a couple weeks ago, he's like, man, they're making a new He-Man movie, how exciting is that? And I'm like, well, I'm an adult, so I, <laughs> I just don't think it works, especially in modern times, the name He-Man? <laughs> it's a little pronoun specific, don't you think? <laughs> maybe call it He-Maybe? <laughs> Them person? <laughs> Sometimes characters will just let you down, though. Like, the biggest letdown for me was Batman. And I'm not talking about the movies. Like, all the movies are cool, but just actually knowing the character. This happened a little ways back. There was, a, uh, there was an animated show in the Batman universe about the character Harley Quinn. And the writers put a joke in there and about Batman. They said Batman was going down on Catwoman. And Warner Brothers nixed the joke. They said, Batman doesn't do that. <laughs> yeah, apparently Batman is the DJ Khaled of superheroes. <laughs> he doesn't go south of the border, okay? W and it's like, uh, their official quote was, good guys don't do that. <laughs> and if that's true, that means get the hand basket, because I'm going to hell. I'm telling you, you ladies cheer, and that's great, but it's really better for both parties, okay? Because sex is fun, but that's where babies come from, so I'm nervous, and when you're having sex, sometimes you open your eyes at the same time, it's like, oh, hey, you're, okay, I'll close first, and... There's just weird rules to sex, like, it's the most fun thing you could do on Earth, yet you're a creep if you smile during it.
You know, just let me do my thing, you do your thing. Give me the canary, I'll go down below, and, and then you ladies can focus on what you do well. You can work on the acting performance of your career. <laughs> and I'm down there getting work done, because going down doesn't, it's not like a talent thing, it's just a heart thing. It's just a <laughs> gritty, gutty, every word you associate with white athletes. That's what going down is. You know, just try your best and just never give up. <laughs> and that's why Batman's mopey all the time, because he can't please a woman. Apparently the world's greatest detective can't find the clitoris. So he's just at home with Alfred watching Blue Bloods night after night. <laughs> Meanwhile, Joker's out there robbing banks, having fun, eating ass, getting things done. You know, as you all let me talk more, you realize why I'm single? <laughs> Which I'm, I, not only do I love being single, I think all my married friends actually love that I'm single. Because all the females that I'm friends with that are married, I'm their little experiment. You know, they love trying to set me up with somebody. And my dude friends, they adore me because I'll get a text like, hey man, what are you doing right now? And I'm like, well, it's 2.30, so I'm watching ESPN, then I'm gonna go take a nap. <laughs> and they're like, can I come over? Can I nap with you, Mark? <laughs> like every couple, sometimes you just need an outlet. I'm your wingman. Come on over. Hang out. Remember what it used to be like. Because I don't know if it's going to happen for old Uncle Mark. I don't. And I don't really care about it. Because we all know that like person who, they're in a serious relationship. They break up, and then they're just not themselves until they meet somebody else. Like I have a friend, they broke up, and then the next week they met somebody new. They're already saying, I love you. They're planning trips together. That's not my speed. Okay? I break up with somebody, I need a good six, seven years to really think about what happened, you know, where she went wrong. <laughs> I do like the dating event, though. Like, dating, it's an event for me. I get up for it, I get excited about it. First date with me, awesome. You're gonna have a great time on the first date. I have some funny stories, I'm charming, I can usually cover the bill. <laughs> Second date, that's when it starts to go downhill. Second date, you're like, he really likes Van Halen. <laughs> Third date, you're like, he fell asleep at the table. Can I leave? I don't know what to do. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I think uh, it just doesn't make sense for me to settle down now when we're so close to interplanetary travel. <laughs> you know? Who knows when it could happen, but if you think when we can just go live on another planet, if you think I'm dragging some Earthling up there with me, <laughs> no, man, I want to be like Star Trek. I want to live long, prosper, and Captain Kirk some hot alien ass. That's the dream. <laughs> My mom is thrilled that I don't have kids. <laughs> so much so that I'm like a little offended. <laughs> because she'll say things to me that she will not say to her other two kids. My sister has one kid, great. My brother's got two kids, awesome. I got a dog and she's like, are you sure you're ready for that responsibility? <laughs> <laughs> and kids in general, they just like, I just feel like we're past the golden age with kids, you know? <laughs> like the 1600s, that was, <laughs> that was how you do it. The 1600s, you could have 10 kids Two of them make it, your father of the year. <laughs> there was no pressure about modern society. There was no worry about school shootings or virtual reality. You had one rule back then, don't talk to the cursed goat. <laughs> Everybody had a farm, there's fun animals. Just that one googly-eyed one, we think it's a witch. Don't talk to that one. <laughs> the Quaker Oat guy said it put a curse on us if you looked at it, so don't do that. Now, man, kids. I just don't find a lot of good reasons to have kids. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, one of the ones they used to hear is, oh, I need to propagate the species. <laughs> There's eight billion of us on Earth. If Earth was a nightclub, the fire marshal would shut it down. <laughs> Had a buddy. He's like, oh, I just kind of wanted a kid because they're cute. <laughs> oh, if, if you think kids are cute, you've only seen the first 10 minutes of Gremlins. <laughs> The best, though, is one of my friends has four kids, and he's like, I don't know, man, I just wanted something to, you know, give a legacy to me. <laughs> he literally said, I just want something to outlive me. And I'm like, dude, you wanted a turtle. <laughs> All right? Turtles are much cheaper. Kids will 
eat you out of house and home. A turtle, one head of lettuce keeps it satisfied for like a decade. You want kids, but you're on a budget? Turtle. Yeah, and it's, it's a funny situation in my family, too, because like, currently there's two single people left. There's me and my mom. And I do okay, but my mom is out there. You know, she travels the world, she meets interesting people, but sometimes it happens where you don't expect it. Like, she started hanging out with a guy who lives up the street. <laughs> and we've had that house for 30 years, he's been there for 30 years. We have both been in that neighborhood for so long, when I was a kid, I took his daughter to a couple high school dances. <laughs> yeah, and remember, boys, going to pick up your date? So nerve-wracking, because you're in your suit, you're sweaty, you ring the doorbell, you know she's not answering. <laughs> She's got to do her bell, Beauty and the Beast, walk down the stairs. <laughs> so it's the dad. And he just opens the door and he's like, you have her home by 1030, young man. I'm like, yes, sir. So this past Thanksgiving, I was home. And guess who came to pick my mom up? <laughs> yep. Oh, I was waiting. I <laughs> it was 3.30 p.m. and I was just sitting in a rocking chair waiting. <laughs> He rings the doorbell, I answer, and he's like, hey, Mark, I'm here to take your mom out. And I'm like, 10, 15, motherfucker. <laughs> you have no idea how weird it is to call someone a motherfucker and have it maybe be accurate. She was seeing this other guy, too, who, uh, who has Netflix. Like, and I don't know what my mom does. I think they're just friends, but I don't know if they Netflix and chill or they Paramount Plus and snore. Whatever they do <laughs> is fine. But she said he has Netflix. And when I tell you he has Netflix, I mean he still has Netflix. Send DVDs <laughs> to his mailbox. I shit you not. Did anybody know that was still an option on the table? That used to be the whole business model. Now it's just the one cubicle in the corner. It's like, well, we can't fire Todd. He's the boss's kid. Just give him a bunch of those envelopes to play with. And I don't long for that era. I don't long for the era of getting DVDs in the mail. I miss the previous era when the whole family would pile in the car Friday night and you go to Blockbuster Video. That was a big night. Big, big night in the Ellis family. Because you drive out there and it was so exciting going to the video store with all this anticipation and you knew you were leaving with your fourth choice. Because we all have the same strategy. You go to the video store, you start new releases, you go A to Z, and then everybody disperses to their favorite section. My sister tried to rent a horror movie. Oh, that's going to scare your little brother. My dad wanted an action movie. Honey, it's rated R. Mark is trying to rent Basic Instinct again. That's not going to work. <laughs> so then you just get in this debate, and it ends 30 minutes later with, well, you know what? Fuck it. Just grab Sister Act again, and we'll all watch that. <laughs> we went to Blockbuster once, but it was like three towns over. So my town, Williamsburg, Virginia, we didn't have Blockbuster. We had the local video store, Video Update, which was actually better than Blockbuster because we had all the same sections they had, but Video Update also had the curtain. <laughs> yeah, the curtain. It was always way in the back, and it was black with, like, glitter and weird stains all over it. <laughs> that was the curtain that led to the adult film section. And you weren't allowed back in there if you were under 18. They had a mirror so everybody could see who was in there. And 12-year-old Mark Ellis came up with a scheme. Yeah. <laughs> Four-person operation, me, my buddies Jack, Brian, and Doug. So Jack got a ride to my house. We rode bikes to Brian's, and then we rode bikes to Doug's. Doug's dad was a Marine, so Doug took this shit seriously. <laughs> he comes out of his house. He's 12 years old, head-to-toe camo. He's like, hey, man, I couldn't get the sword, but I got a knife. And we're like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> so here's what I came up with. My job was to distract the front clerk guy, right? You know the guy who's always judging you, he's got his picks <laughs> that are sacred. Doesn't matter what you're renting, he's gonna say it's not good enough. <laughs> like, oh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Kubrick's other space movie. <laughs> Have you seen the moon landing? <laughs> so my job is to entertain that guy. Brian, Jack, they were the lookout, and then Doug was the most crucial part of the operation. Doug, G.I. Joe crawled back there. And he couldn't get back to the magical land of Oz, but he could reach his hand around the corner and he could pull a movie. Only problem was he couldn't see what movie he was pulling. <laughs> so first time we tried it, he pulled Edward Penis Hands. <laughs> so now we gotta watch a movie about a guy with five dicks on his hand. 
which ended up being one of my top 10 favorite film experiences of all time. Because we put it on at my house where we had all the good snacks and we're watching it and this is like two in the morning and my mom comes downstairs half awake just to get a glass of water. She walks through the living room like, oh, I love Winona Ryder. Good night, guys. <laughs> so then Doug pulled another one the next week. We got cocky and he pulled Hot Asian Invasion 6. <laughs> yeah, if you know anything about that franchise, that's when it got good. <laughs> That was their Fast Five. <laughs> but that's not the end of the mission. Now you have to go to another section and switch the tapes out with something we're allowed to rent. So he goes to the family section. First movie he sees, The Adventures of Milo and Otis. <laughs> if you don't remember that movie, it's a dog and a cat, and they go across the country together. It's a great journey. <laughs> and the guy working there thinks, we can't wait to get home to see this. <laughs> and the next guy that tries to rent Hot Asian Invasion 6 instead gets the adorable journey of a dog and a cat going across the country together. And it's just such a weird mind fuck to think all those guys that I came up with that scheme with, they have families. <laughs> and me, I just moved out, out to LA and I, and I chased this dream and it's going okay now, but I mean, there's a lot of misadventures you get into back in the day. And I used to work at the, uh, the World Famous Comedy Store. I used to be an employee there. And you do whatever they ask you to do. You park the cars, you clean up the puke, work the front desk. So <laughs> I drank a lot. And I remember I got home one night and I was hammered and it was my little studio apartment, right? I've since added a whole bedroom to the empire. So I, whenever you get home and you're drunk, you're some level of one of three things. You're either tired, you're hungry, or you're horny. And you don't know which one you are all the time. Sometimes you think you're one, and it turns out, no, you were something else. <laughs> so a couple weeks prior to this, I had met a sex worker at a gentleman's establishment. <laughs> if you're over 50 in this room, I met a hooker at a strip club. <laughs> and so I got her number, and she's like, we should hang out sometime. And I'm like, oh, we should hang out sometime. <laughs> and so I get home from the comedy store. I'm hammered, and I make two phone calls. And then I pass out. I called her, and I called Pizza Hut. <laughs> and then I fell asleep. So I woke up the next day, I had a bunch of missed calls, and then I got two texts that morning. One was from her, and it said, thanks for the pizza, asshole. <laughs> and then the other one was from the Pizza Hut guy, and it said, dude, anytime you need pizza, you give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody out pieces the hut, but I out pussy the hut that night. <laughs> yeah, but you get older in life and you think, oh wait, there's more, there's more stages to this whole thing than we originally thought, right? Because when you're a kid, you think, oh, I'm gonna grow up, I'll meet somebody, I'll get married, I'll have kids, that's the end. No, no, I'm here to tell you, if you're still single and you're my age, there's more to life. There's more phases than you were taught. I just entered a new one that I never knew existed. Nobody told me about this, but now I'm in the phase of my life. A lot of my married friends, they're getting divorced. My friends are coming back. <laughs> if you love something, set it free. <laughs> and you feel bad for the family or whatever, but you're also excited, right? You're like, <laughs> you're like, I got my body back, sweet. But you gotta be careful. That's not really your friend anymore, is it? No, it looks like your friend, but they've been through some shit you can't understand. <laughs> So it's like you took your friend as you knew them, buried them in Pet Cemetery, and now they're back. Like, hey, what's up, man? <laughs> hey, man, you got any of those PlayStation 5s left? I saw a, a, a tweet. You got any? <laughs> um, I do sincerely want to thank you all for coming out tonight. You guys have been a, uh, a fantastic crowd. And really, this was like, this was the exact scenario that me and every other comedian was envisioning when we were in lockdown and we couldn't perform in front of y'all night after night. And you just think, when am I gonna get to get back here? Because when the lockdown started, I actually was in Vegas and I had to scramble to get a flight home. So when you're scrambling to get a flight home, what airline do you use? Spirit. It's Southwest. It's Southwest. Who the fuck said Spirit? <laughs> I need to go from Vegas to LA and I don't wanna go through Cairo to get there. <laughs> Spirit isn't an airline, it's an escape room. 
No. You want to fly Southwest. <laughs> so I flew Southwest. I have money. <laughs> and I think my letter was like G, and I didn't know they went that high. And, but I'm sitting on the plane. I'm in row 38. Success. <laughs> and I'll never forget as long as I live. Like 15 rows ahead of me, a guy sneezed. And for the first time in my life, nobody blessed him. <laughs> Not one of the three nuns sitting right behind him <laughs> blessed him. And it was weird. It was like a good sneeze, too. It was like that, that old man sneeze. That, aha! <laughs> like they're really sick or they just found treasure. Aha! <laughs> so he sneezed once. Nobody blessed him. We all got silent. He sneezed again, and we murdered him. He's dead. <laughs> And that story warms my heart for two reasons. One, I got to kill a guy. <laughs> and two, uh, a couple months ago, I got to go back to Vegas for the first time since the pandemic, and I got to work there. <laughs> and it was awesome, because Vegas was back, and people were gambling, and restaurants were full, and it was awesome. And I was reminded that there is a fantasy to doing stand-up that is not the reality. There's a difference. You have your fantasy of what you think the job is, and then the reality of what the gig actually is. So the fantasy of stand-up is that you're gonna go on the road, and you're gonna entertain audiences, and you're gonna make a bunch of beautiful women laugh. And then one of them is gonna come back to your hotel room with you, and you make love all night long. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but I've only been doing this 17 years, so there's still time. <laughs> the reality is you go on the road, you make a bunch of beautiful women laugh, and then you go back to your hotel room alone, and the sex is always happening right next door. <laughs> I've heard a lot of people have sex. And it's fun now. <laughs> but back when I was a young comic, it freaked me out. First time I heard it, I didn't know how to react. Because when I was a kid, I never heard my parents have sex. They wrestled a lot, never heard them have sex. <laughs> <laughs> Occasionally you see dad take a leak in the middle of the night. Why is he wearing a cape? You know what? He's a wrestler. That's what I'm going with. So first time I was on the road and I had it, I was doing a, a gig somewhere in the Midwest and like the painting on my wall was vibrating. And what do you do in that situation? Do you call the front desk and complain? Do you ride it out? I was like, look, I'm gonna give them 10 minutes. And then I came. So I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> this escalated quickly. Um, so then you just wait another 10 minutes and you bang on the wall. Hey, I'm ready to try again. Sorry about that. First timer. But now I'm a pro. I'm good. Best time I ever heard other people have sex? which is a great way to start a conversation at a dinner party. <laughs> Best time I ever heard other people have sex, San Diego Comic-Con, 2018. Woo! Oh, what a time it was. And it was so beautiful, because it was nerds doing it, you know? <laughs> and like, the misconception about us nerds is that we don't have sex. That's not true, we don't have a lot. <laughs> but when we do, you ever see a raccoon eat a filet mignon? <laughs> it's not gonna last long, but man, you'll remember that the rest of your life. So I'm in my hotel room, it's th Saturday night, 3 a.m., I'm about to pass out. I hear the door next to me close. And by this point in my career, I know the difference between like one person and like an excited couple. <laughs> this was the latter. So these people get back to their room and the first thing that turned me on that they might be doing something lovemaking-like <laughs> was not the sounds of passion. First thing I heard, music. I heard the faint strains of a classic John Williams theme song. <laughs> These people got home from being at Comic-Con all day, eating hot dogs, reading comic books, and they said, tonight's the night that we make love to Jurassic Park. <laughs> yeah. you know, I got out of bed and opened a beer. I was like, this is going to be fun. <laughs> I'm yelling lines from the movie. Hold on to your butts. <laughs> Use a condom. Life finds a way. And I knew it was getting good. I knew one of them was about to have the moment because it was loud, the music was swelling. On my nightstand, I had a glass of water and it started to ripple. <laughs> and I tell you that story not to embarrass anybody. No, if you're in LA for the weekend, if you're going on a trip soon with your significant other, I want you to get in a hotel and have the loudest, most boisterous sex of your entire life. I just want you to realize we can hear you too. So make it fun for everyone. <laughs> right? Yell out something that's going to make me laugh. Yahtzee always works. 
go board game with it. You sunk my battleship. <laughs> I'm a nerd, so whenever I climax, I say, Chewy, we're home. <laughs> Make it competitive. And you're a winner! <laughs> ladies, don't do this thing you usually do, ladies. Don't do the, oh, God, okay? Oh, God, oh, God, God can't hear you. I can't. Make it fun for me. Do, do your favorite fast food jingle. Right there. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. <laughs> Go political. Epstein was murdered. <laughs> Make it historical. Oh, right there. Right there. Six Semper Tyrannus. <laughs> My name is Mark Ellis. Thank you guys so much. Two single people. It's me and my mom. Is that our color? <laughs> that was so fucked up that you did that for my mom. It's like, yeah. I think my dad's up in heaven like, hey, don't talk about your mom being single like that, son. Kill the lights. Get rid of the bit.